Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it, we thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I see them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> It's a proper Welsh washout today for the takeout and tear down boys at St. Athen Air Base. And the lads all seem very happy to be hiding out in the hangar to avoid the deluge. As always, they're hard at work stripping and scrapping commercial aircraft that have reached the end of their working lives. These planes won't be taking to the skies again because their new owners believe these old aircraft are more valuable to them as parts planes. And team leader Sam is on tenterhooks waiting for E-Cube's latest arrival. So uh, we've got a 737 coming in in about three hours' time. Um, we've got a lot of work to do on it, a lot of priority uh, components to come off. Uh, engines may have been the main ones. Um, the biggest issue we've got at the moment is uh, looking out there is the weather. Um, if it gets too bad, visibility is bad, then the aircraft might not arrive, which uh, we really cannot be doing with. We need it here so we can crack on, get the jobs done. The plane will be flying to St. Athen from more than 700 miles away, starting its journey in Scandinavia, where, unlike the weather in Wales, here the weather is befitting of a Christmas card. This 737 is operated by a commercial airliner from snowy Scandinavia, who are upgrading their entire fleet. And at 19 years old, this plane has reached retirement age, so is being taken out of service. As the highest selling commercial jetliner in history, the 737 is perhaps the plane that is most familiar to us all. And Captain Matt Henriksen has spent more time in them than most. He's a pilot with more than 23 years flying experience, many of those in a 737. So it's only fitting that he would be taking her on her final voyage. It's one last check before he heads to the cockpit. My name is Matt Sennickson. I'm the fleet chief pilot on the 737. And today we are going to deliver this uh, baby behind me to uh, Cardiff or near Cardiff in Wales. Uh, it's a Boeing 737-600. It was manufactured in 1999. This flight will be the last flight for this aircraft before it's dismantled, and the parts will be used on other flying 77s here around the world. The weather today here is a bit hazy, and in the St. Athens, we can expect also low clouds and a rather windy condition, so we might have some turbulence during the later part of the flight. Trust. This Scandinavian winter wonderland is a truly magical setting for the plane's final send-off. Let's just hope the conditions are E-Cube clear before her final landing into South Wales. But whatever the weather, Captain Matz is clearly a man who enjoys his work. And with a view like that, who can blame him? Uh, it was a, a regular smooth takeoff. Nothing ordinary. It's just an ordinary day at work. 
this is a really good office. You uh, get to see the sun uh, every day when you are at work. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter if it's raining or snowing, whatever, at home. When you go to work, you know that you're going to see the sun. That's fantastic. I never get bored with this view or the view of uh, entering the clouds from above when you descend to the airport. Uh, I, you get the sensation of speed. Uh, it's lovely. I just, I just love it. Whilst pilot Mats might have his head above the clouds and the sun on his face, on the ground in St. Athen, it's a very different story. The weather today isn't great. Uh, the visibility is next to nothing, so it might affect the aircraft's ability to land at St. Athen today. And Bob's not too hopeful the plane will be making it either. A lovely day for it. The cloud base is very low. Uh, as far as I know, it'll probably be the same pilot who does these ferry flights every time and does know this airfield, but I, I doubt it very much if he'll make it today. If the plane can't land, it has costly repercussions for the airlines, starting with a detoured flight, clocking up a bill in excess of $1,000 for taxes and other charges, such as fuel and staffing costs. I spoke to the tower on the way in. They said he's on his way, but they, they're doubtful as well. And he'll try. First thing we'll know, he'll either land or we'll hear him going overhead. Bob doesn't need radar confirmation to know that the plane is in a holding pattern high above him and unable to land due to the poor conditions. For more than 30 minutes now, he's been tormented by the sound of the plane echoing above the airbase. The only possible option is to land at neighboring Cardiff Airport, where the weather is slightly clearer and they can rely on a fully operational instrument landing system. But this option is far from ideal. Landing at another airport will rack up additional costs of more than $1,000 in landing fees to be paid for in full by the Scandinavian airline. So uh, we will now fly to Cardiff uh, at 10,000 feet and enter a holding pattern. Nine one two one runway two five ten land wind two five zero one five max two two knots one way wet wet wet. Fifty, forty, thirty, twenty, ten. Eight, six knots. Putting Plan B into action, Captain Matz brings the seven three seven down to Cardiff International Airport. Cardiff International Airport sits across the fence from EQ, but if the plane is sat on the ground much longer, it could be delayed a further 24 hours due to the diminishing light. They'd incur landing fees, and also, if it didn't get back here that particular day, hotel fees for the air crew and subsequent costs for that. The weather on this stretch of the Welsh coastline has its own unique microclimate and can change by the minute, which is exactly what's happened today. Acting fast, the lads in the control tower have come up with a plan that will get the plane to EQ without racking up a hefty bill, and it involves one of the shortest flights in aviation history. Potentially what we could do <clears throat> is to um, put it to Cardiff to put to the crew that potentially now that the weather has cleared up, uh, he could um, just hop over. Um, visually, straight off their runway 30 and straight onto our runway 25. You won't need to get very high because there's only a couple of miles between their threshold where he takes off and our threshold where he lands. Amazing. Yeah. Hello, yes, it's Cardiff. May I help you? Hello, it's St. Athens Tower. Um, the uh, Scandinavian that's just landed, obviously, we've got a weather improvement now, so we, we are available if it, like, if it would like to pop across. Um, so he's has hopped over from Cardiff in St. Athens before, so he's, he's, he's done it and he's, he's conversant with the procedure. Um, so he has asked his operations to file a flight plan for it because it's going to need it. Um, and then they're going to put some fuel on board and then uh, see, if we can, uh, see if we can sort that out for them. If the plane doesn't leave Cardiff Airport soon, the onboard crew will miss their next commercial flight at cost to the airline. So it's action stations for Bob to prepare the runway for landing. Well, the latest I've heard is taking off from Cardiff Airport at half past three. As you see, the weather's cleared up a bit here, so fingers crossed. He'll be down in a couple of minutes' time. As Bob plays the waiting game with the runway, back in the control tower with the visibility clearing, James is able to get a visual fix on the runway at Cardiff Airport, proving that this job isn't just all about technology. That is Cardiff Airport over there, so we can see aircraft taxiing around on the ground out there, taking off and landing. You can see it take off and you can see it land. 
in two different airfields, which is, is unusual for, for uh, airfields in Great Britain. Yeah. Back at Cardiff Airport, the Scandinavian plane has been given permission to take off, and Bob's got his eyes on it. Yep, here she comes. Made it. It's just got airborne from 3 0 at Cardiff for a left turn straight in the 25. Scandinavian 9121, runway 25, take land, wind 25015, max 22 knots, long way, wet, wet, wet. Conjet uh, 9009, sir, I think. Nothing scandies on the ground. Thanks. With just seconds to spare, Captain Matz has taken the 737 to a height of just under a thousand feet and made one of the shortest and lowest flying flights in the history of commercial aviation, taking just 135 seconds in the air from tarmac to tarmac. And smiling Bob's on hand to guide the plane and greet an old friend. Well, well, well. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> Generally, the pilots who bring the airline aircraft in will be a senior captain or training captain. And they, if we've had, say, a run of five aircraft, it'll be the same one each time. So we tend to meet them a lot, and you get a rapport going together. Yeah, we know them, they know us, and it's, it's, it's great. Hey, Carol. Yeah, oh, we will. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. Great, I will fill the log book. Yeah, OK, yeah, thank you. Yeah. This is end of life. So on Monday, we're going to run the engines and take them off, and then um, where it owns, it'll start negotiating who to sell it to and contract us to part it out for them. The delayed landing and airport hopping antics of this aircraft has already caused this job to stack up thousands of dollars of additional costs. It will have to be paid for by the Scandinavian airline, who right now still operate the plane. Mike, E-Cube's commercial director, has arrived on the taxiway as he needs his lads to start stripping out plane parts as soon as possible to help claw back some of the aircraft owners' quickly diminishing profit. We're the least of the worries. The knock-on effect is to the operator. They still have this aircraft in their fleet. They're trying to re-deliver it to an owner. The owner's here, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to get their asset back, and it's all about um, money sitting on the ground, fundamentally. For Captain Matz, it's a final and very fond farewell. Now we have parked this aircraft for the last time. Uh, it's obviously a bit sad, but uh, then again, that's life. Uh, she will uh, be uh, giving parts to other aircraft worldwide. As Matt heads to the airport to take a commercial flight home, as a passenger this time, it's left to Bob to send the 737 off for a big sleep after almost two decades of trusted service. There we are. With the lights out for the last time, the plane is now a dark and silent place. When you finally turn that switch off, it's a feeling of sadness, really, because that it's like... Uh, <laughs> almost like euthanizing an aircraft. Having flown more than 40,000 hours and carried millions of passengers around the world, its life in the sky is now just a distant memory. The troublesome Welsh weather has meant that the Scandi 737 arrived more than two hours later than expected. But with such vast amounts of money at stake, deadlines just won't wait and the expectant customer has demanded that the 737's valuable engines be stripped and shipped out by midnight. With a lorry already inbound to collect them, the lads have no option but to work late into the night to try and claw back some of the lost time. Just better drop this engine, and as you can see, it's getting dark. It's got to come off tonight, it's a um, party, party job. Um, we'll, we'll get through it, we'll get it off. We'll just use torches, lamps, anything we can find around to light it up for us. Uh, we'll get there. Always will. Removing an engine outside after dark is an extremely rare procedure, and for good reason. Even doing it in daylight when you can see what you're doing is nail-biting stuff, as any slight dink, dent or damage could mean disastrous consequences. It's a lot harder doing an engine job at night. <laughs> so we've got, uh, over the last few years, we've sourced different lighting, head torches, with the head torches and lights we've got, it makes life a lot, a lot easier. It's not ideal, but um, gets the job done. 
The lads are under pressure to get them off right away, so the most experienced team has been put on the job. Bob and Sam will work alongside an approved maintenance engineer working under the seller's instruction. 737, the CFM 56-7 engine, which we're about to remove, hopefully before it gets dark. Whilst the engine's on the winch, it's not just a case of simply lowering it. On the engine at the minute, we're just putting what we call the bootstrap kit on, which is basically the mounting points for the winches and all that. You take the nose cowl off, take those cowls off, undo the panel on the top, and fit the bootstrap kit so we can put the, uh, the winches on it and winch it down nicely into its cradle, and then we can tow it into the warm hangar, <laughs> which would be nice. This is uh, the winch set up for the front of the engine. This will, this will take the weight of the front of the engine. It's about two and a half ton, I think it is. Everything to do with aircraft is just crazy money. And that's just for small components. But then when you start getting to the, the actuators and that, they operate the, uh, the flying controls. I mean, I can't, I can't give you a round figure, but you're looking thousands, thousands of pounds for each component. Taking them off, you've just got to be aware of what, what you're doing and how everything's are. And you just got to take care that way and stuff. The engine is heavier at the front than it is at the back, which means the weight must be distributed evenly or it could tilt over and cause serious damage. What do you want now? Has that moved any? Yeah. I'm on four, yeah? yeah so if you're on... I'm, I'm ready, two together. It's their first chance to inspect the engine closely. And it's clear why the airline are so keen to get hold of this engine, because it hasn't got many flying miles on the clock. It's looking very clean, very clean indeed. It's quite a new engine, and it's been well looked after in its life. If you go through, through there, through that bit. We'll push the stand in, lift it up into place, drop it back down, and then winch the engine into the stand. Just waiting for the rear bolts to be removed now. They, they are quite awkward on these. It's one side you have to undo from the other side. You get what I mean? You can't, you can't, you can't get a swing on them. Take the weight off the um, winches completely. Pull the engine out, tidy up, and go on. Under the supervision of the airline's approved engineer, Sam and Bob have got the engine detached from the aircraft in record time. Just over two hours for a job that can often take upwards of six. It's all off. Take it out, put it in the hangar, tidy up. It's now 1 a.m. in the morning, and there's a lorry standing by waiting for the engine. The lads have worked wonders. Hello, it's Andrew from eCube Solutions. Yeah, the truck's now loaded and your engines are on their way. All right? Yeah, we'll send you photos over shortly. OK, no problem. Any issues, give me a call. All right, cheers, bye, bye. The customer's over the moon that we've got these done in time because they want to get these engines out and on another aircraft and fly them. It's all done. It's, like, it's pitched back out there now. But uh, we got through it in the end with uh, no, no dramas. So uh, time to wrap up, go home, and just hope my dinner's uh, not in the bin and uh, ready for me, yeah? Got a missus, but be glad to see us. The engines from the Scandi 737 have gone to their new owner, but there's no shortage of customers queuing up for parts from her. Don't go thinking this is a free-for-all to get spare parts. Remember, this is not a scrapyard. Got some potential clients of the aircraft that came in earlier on in the week. I'm going to open the door up for them so they can carry out an inspection of the aircraft. The aviation industry is highly regulated and every part that's put on or taken off the plane is followed and monitored for the entirety of its lifetime. Each part has a certain life limit, and it's all tracked by flight cycles, how much it has flown throughout the whole history of this part. And after it reaches a certain amount of life value, it needs to be discarded, destroyed, and it cannot be any longer installed in aircraft. The clients on the base are from Estonia and are big players in the trade of second-hand plane parts. Today, they have a hefty shopping list and a budget to match. Over a million dollars for spare parts. Although it's a fairly old aircraft, as you can see, it's um, 
it's well looked after. It's in lovely condition. And just looking at the flight deck there, it's been beautifully looked after and fully updated with um, all the recent modifications. There's a very good market for these uh, type of aircraft. I think it's the most popular small aircraft around the Boeing 737. A flight deck in this condition could be worth as much as tens of thousands of dollars. But that's not all the Estonians have their eyes on. They're also in the market for one of the most critical pieces of technology on the plane, the engine's thrust reversers. More of that later. Before the remainder of the 737 can be torn down, the plane has to be stripped of any piece of kit that could cause a hazard in the dismantling process. And one of the most dangerous of these is to be found in an airplane toilet. The job of removing it has fallen to technician David Brown. We're removing uh, what the guys call hazmat, which is hazardous materials. And they come in various shapes and forms. In this example, this is a fire extinguisher, and its purpose is to respond to uh, anyone who has the inclination to dispose of a cigarette into the waste bins. So these prongs here, they will detect any potential heat source that would come from the bin caused by someone disposing of a cigarette. And the last thing you want, of course, with paper towels is a... Uh, a a, a cigarette end, uh, which is likely to catch fire in these waste bins. But just exactly how does that life-saving bit of kit work then, Die? In this example, it's a halon fire extinguisher, and it's fitted and will respond if it detects any heat. Of course, the three components to start a fire, heat, fuel, and oxygen. You remove any one of those components, and you can't have a fire. So what Halon does is remove the oxygen from the area, therefore cancelling out the fire. And remember, getting caught smoking on a flight can lead to imprisonment and a lifetime ban from the airline. The pilot will be aware that a fire extinguisher has been initiated and he can take action to see who the silly person was who couldn't resist a cigarette on the flight home from wherever he's been or going to. I have victory. There it is. Back in the hangar, and the next clever bit of mechanics the lads need to strip out are the thrust reversers, an aerodynamic structure that surrounds the jet engine. Each one of these has a value of almost $200,000, and after the engines are one of the most valuable parts that can come off an aeroplane. This morning, we're taking the push reverser ducts off. So uh, we have to wait for the engines to come off to be able to remove these. Probably is a way of doing them with the engines on, but we haven't got the gear for that. So it's, uh, we've got two, two like clamshells that go around the engine. They've got the push reverser doors inside it. The thrust reversers act as a braking system for the aircraft on landing, forcing air backwards through the engine. We've all experienced firsthand what it feels like when a thrust reverser kicks in, as Sam reminds us. If you're on board, sometimes you can feel it. The aircraft will start shaking quite, quite a lot. And that's normally a sensor. And you'll, it'll get progressively louder as well when he, uh, when he engages the reverse thrust. So there'll be a lot, of, a lot more engine noise. So the engines will be coming down, and then it will accelerate them up and then they'll open the blocker doors. And it, you'll feel the wings will start shaking and that. Yeah, that's, that's my experience from, from when I've uh, been on board. The Estonian clients we saw earlier have bought these thrust reverses from the 737's owner so they can refurbish them and sell them on to another airline. And it's going to be somewhat of a military operation to get them stripped off and shipped out. It's a big old bit of kit. Uh, you know, looking at about a third of a tonne, each one. And we just remove it the forklifts. We get the carpenters in and they assist us and get it down into the uh, the base. So that's uh, that's the next job. In the carpenters shop, we make roughly well over a thousand crates a year, from all different sizes, two foot to eight, ten meters and the widths are the same and the heights. Whatever part comes off it, we box it. The 
they can't come off the shelf. Everyone has got to be made precise for every part. These crates we make, we've got to take pride in it because they're traveling all around the world. They go by ship, they go by the aircraft, so they've got to be sturdy to travel. Every part of this aircraft is very valuable to the customer. That's why they've got to be packed down, precise. The value of it is over the top of anything that I would know of, but they've got to travel and everything, so they've got to be packed, secured down. Every aircraft is different size, length, width, and everything. So they've all got to be bespoke made. So that's how it's a challenge every day with us. So. All aircraft parts got to be strapped, numbered, photographed. Everything is very, very valuable. I like it. It is very good. Um, it's something new every day. It's a challenge, you know, for every uh, crate. The thrust reversers are a valuable piece of kit to have on the shelf because they can be put straight to work on any Boeing 737 in the world, should the need for a replacement arise. They can swap these about, yeah. So they got an unserviceable one on an aircraft. They can pull one of these out of the supply company's uh, stocking out and, leave, and fit it to the aircraft. I believe that these ones could fit on the other wing as well. The outboard one this side is identical to the inboard one on the other side. So uh, they're quite interchangeable in that way. Sam may be an old hand at this, but he has some new crew members in sight. I have not uh, done before the, uh, this kind of things, thrust reverser, but Sam uh, with me, he's a good teacher, so I'll be all right. Getting them off the plane is one thing. They then have to be transferred to their own bespoke crate that's made by one of the team of on-site carpenters. These sit on fabricated feet and they, they have to bolt them down onto the base and we need to make sure they go in the right position on the base. So the captain's got little um, former jigs that they set down so we can set the feet in them. If we don't get in the right place at this point, then at some point along the line, we've got to start manhandling it, lifting it. And you don't want to be lifting these by hand, you know, say, uh, all their age, all getting on a bit here, and end up with bad backs and the like. So if we can get it down now in the right position, and all the carpenters got to do is strap it down to the base and then box the uh, box it in afterwards. So it's, it's easier for us because we don't have to go and help them afterwards, and it's easier for them to say, got to manhandle it even. It's all good doing it this way. The last piece of the thrust reverser is lowered into place. We've got one component take off the actuator. Once that's off, that's what's finished with them, yeah, so it's part of the line. But there's a schedule to be kept, Sam, and no time for chit-chat. Should I just throw this in and shut him up? Big boy. <laughs> All four off the aircraft now, and uh, then the components will go over to the carpenters for them to crate, uh, tie them down and crate them all up, and that'll be the last we see of them. It sure will, as once they leave E-Cube, their new Estonian owner will get them refurbished before selling them on to an expectant airline in India for a whopping $1.5 million. It's full steam ahead for the takeout and tear down of the Scandi 737. Parts are being pulled left, right, and centre. But it's all good news for the owner as Andrew received an intriguing phone call from someone interested in picking up a part. But they're not planning on putting it into another aircraft. I just had a call from a client who's a regular customer in the furniture industry, and um, they want to come down and do a, a walk around and see what um, material we've got here that they can come and make some new design furniture from. So, uh, yeah, it goes to show these things can be turned into so many different things. Almost 200 miles from the base in St. Athens is the market town of Bury St. Edmunds. Based there is a furniture company who were one of the first to realise that there's endless possibilities for making furniture and objects from used plane parts. And many of their recently crafted pieces have originated from components sourced at eCube. My name's David Palmer. I'm the manager director of Dapper Aviation. David and his team have recently sourced a whole plane section from the lads in Wales, which was part of an Airbus A320, a plane very similar in size to our Boeing 737. And it seems that David has become adept at transforming the use of pretty much any component from any aircraft. 
So this is uh, a piece of an Airbus A320 and uh, we're making this into an exhibition unit. As you can see, all the ribs are still there, the windows are still here. And we're going to put some doors on here and use it as our exhibition unit. And when we deliver this to a customer, it can be for anything from a sauna to a, a bar or whatever they want to use it, even an office. An aircraft is made of steel, titanium, aluminium, all these really hard metals and cold metal. What we try and do here is combine the beautiful wood that we work with with the piece of metal, which softens and makes them warmer, makes it nicer in the home. And pretty much all the pieces on display here have come from old planes at E-Cube. We find that what we pick up from the scrap people, if you like, or our suppliers of aircraft parts is we don't pick and choose. We can't do that because if we pick and choose, they don't want to see us again. So we tend to take as much as we possibly can. Certain things will lend themselves to certain things. So for example, if you've got a lovely piece of metal that's round, it makes sense to make something like a coffee table out of it. If it's, especially if it's heavy. So we've got to look at the weights of pieces of metal as well. And what we're trying to do here is use as much as we possibly can uh, and make it usable for the general public and have a story. But David's perhaps saved the most ingenious object to last. Who'd have thought an old jet fighter could be turned into these stylish mirrors? These are all from the Tornado, so different parts of that jet engine. And what we've decided to do is put some colour into them to make them appeal to a different marketplace. Just down the road from David in Bury St Edmunds is a coffee shop that he's kitting out to be ready to take paying punters. David is hard at work, and it looks like those refurbished plane parts are going to take pride of place. This is our first retail outlet that's done, and I think if we can do this to a multitude of places, we're going to make customers very happy. This is the, the dressing on the cake, if you like, so I think it looks stunning. David seems well pleased, but let's find out ourselves. Cheers. I couldn't agree more. What a lovely job. Most of the valuable components have been stripped out of the 737. Thank you very much. All that's left now is for dynamic duo Timo and Di to strip out the last few items on the wish list. We're up on a lifter uh, on the left wing of uh, Boeing 737 at the wingtip, which is what we're removing today. I've taken most of the bolts out. Uh, all that uh, remains is to break the... Um, uh, the seal, we've got uh, sealant that goes in between the wing and the wingtip. Just try and break the bond of that seal. I give it a waggle, then I'll get Di probably to come up, because they, they are quite weighty, these, uh, as opposed to the, um, the Airbus. The Airbus is quite a bit lighter. It did have lights in. Uh, the lights that you see when they're on the ground, obviously red for left and green for right. Timo needs Di's helping hand with the wingtip. What could possibly go wrong? What are we removing again? Uh, wing, the whole thing. Oh, See, it's wobbling. Oh. Yeah, so... You don't want me to check anything for you? I'm a professional, after all. It's just kind of tidying up the aircraft. Loose ends, if you like. OK, OK. Let you let the... Oh, torches changed. <laughs> We're just about finished the aircraft, to be honest. A few bits in the cabin. What we do at the end is Sam comes around, because Sam's just about the most experienced guy here. And he'll come around, and they make a list of the stuff that's still in, and, and Sam will be able to say, well, that shouldn't be in. You know, the customer will want that. All right. <laughs> I took out some electronic boxes that I didn't know were there, but uh, Sam does, because he knows all the places where they are. Do we have a pallet ready for it? Across the other side of the aircraft. It'll be easier to carry that over there. Yeah, sure. As long as you feel up to it. I've got the heavy end again, I see. Why is that? Why do I always get the heavy end? Well, the greater responsibility is the driver, the oh. driving of it, which is why I'm at the front. But that's got very little to do with the heavy end, has it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They'll probably take this out tomorrow. There's a couple of the boys are outside on another aircraft, so that's where I'll be tomorrow. Out in the cold, in the rain. OK, two labels, and job done.
The lads have got to get a wiggle on. The Scandi's been stripped of her parts and has now been moved to the yard, ready for scrapping much sooner than anticipated. It's come as a bit of a surprise to everyone. Everyone, that is, except Andrew. This aircraft that we've finished now has had probably the most we've ever stripped from an aircraft. It's relatively new, relatively good condition, so the customers would normally take a 1,000 pieces. This one, they've taken twice as many because all the interiors are gone, the seats are gone. There's not much left of it at all, which is good because then it's obviously being recycled. Um, so, yeah, it's been a really good project. The customer's really happy with everything they've had. Fortunately, the lads were able to rally the troops. All of the necessary manpower and equipment to get the job done. We've got TAC Banksman. Carl's just doing whatever he does, and TAC's organising the crane. But what can't see us, and we'll sort it out of you. Chicken's off with the flu, so it's over to Perry to step up and run the scrapping. Nick held us all in the room and said, I'm in charge. What she doesn't flick! These doors are being stripped and then they'll be shipped off to a training school for cabin crew to practice on. The pieces have been pre-cut, ready to be removed by the crane on site. How will the lads cope with that chicken running the show? Yes, we are missing chicken dearly, we are. All right, pick <laughs> her up, Jock. We are missing him as a, one of the boys, but we're getting everything done. It's not a problem. As always on the yard, the prep makes everything run smoothly, even if Chicken is a no-show today with his man flu. Yeah, going very well. Yeah, smoothly. Due to the fact that everything was prepped properly prior to uh, the uh, the lifts. An expert just, banksman. Just makes it a lot easier. I don't know about the banksman, but... <laughs> It's all too easy in a situation like this for other people to talk, start trying to direct the driver as well. And you can only have one guy. And to be truthful, Tack is glad Chicken is not there because Perry's let them get on with it. We've got uh, two uh, overwing doors to take off. We've got the four passenger doors, front and rear. It's all going quite well at the moment. Don't speak too soon, Tack. The day is not done yet. Sit. I admit, yeah, there's a bit of pressure because we've got to get... The customer is waiting for them. So we've got to get them down, we've got to get them into the hangar so the boys can get them wrapped up, ready for shipping. Oh, kiting. Get the rope. <laughs> and down. And down. I think they should be going out first thing Monday morning. So time constraints for them, maybe, but not for us, because this is our day-to-day -day running and we know what we're doing out here, so it all... Not being cocky or anything about it, but everything's flowed out really nice today and we're really happy with it. Have they spoken too soon? A cable straggling from the door is stopping it being moved. Hello! Hello! Whoa! But some fancy footwork from the lads on the ground pulls it free of the fuselage and delivers it onto the pallet. But all doors are off and now we've just got the... The last cut is the uh, the cockpit, and that's it. These doors will go straight over to 75 hanging. They'll get processed, booked in. They'll wrap them up, ready, ready for the shipping. Then. Back over at the yard, the Scandinavian 737 is nearing the end of the road. It's just the small matter of a cockpit removal before it will face its final demolition. And as always, it's safety first. All right, gentlemen. Yes. And you too. Yeah, we're ready. What's happening, mate? It's all free. Do you want to give it a bit of lift? Proud of his previous prep, Perry is confident that the cockpit can be lifted straight off the fuselage. So Tack orders the crane driver to get on with it. Is that the wheel well? Hang on, guys. This looks a bit solid, guys. I think there might be a couple of the uh, bits down the bottom here. Oh, I don't see that. Nothing's been cleared out, so I don't know. Well, you need the disc cutter down there, then. The disc cutter isn't going to go that deep, guys. I'm going to take a little bit of weight off it. All right, take it down a little bit, just a that. We've got to clear everything out when we're doing these cuts, boy. It looks like Perry's been a bit overconfident, as the cockpit still seems solidly linked to the rest of the fuselage. A couple of the cuts haven't been made underneath the floor. That's what I'm thinking, anyway. It seemed very solid then when we tried to put a bit of weight on it. We'll see what they find now. 
Perry needs to find the route out of this problem quickly, as the cockpit needs to be saved for its new owner, and the lads yeah. need to get on with scrapping the remaining fuselage. It's all clear. Yeah? All, all open. Try it out, Tack. OK. Jock, you need to slew that way a little bit, mate. Slew forward. See if we can pull it away. Still something catching it, guys. I know. The cockpit just won't budge. Just a little bit more work cleaning out underneath and cutting through the uh, undercarriage bay. Tack, can you see my hand by you? It's not connected by you. In the lads' rush to get the job completed, they've overlooked the removal of a small yet troublesome box. It was hairy. We got caught by uh, one little J20 box just underneath the door. Where the rib is, the box was there. And what we couldn't see through there. That'll be it, then. Bring it over. That's why you say you've got to clear all the blankets out. Once everything's out the way and you can see daylight, you know it's ready. Whoa! Just one of those things, you know. This is why we check and recheck. But uh, obviously, we didn't recheck enough. All right, Phil, you're in charge of the crate. Tack takes charge and tackles the last bits holding the cockpit to the fuselage. Now it is. Depending on uh, whether you've got it stropped up properly, it might swing. And swing it does. Would the disc cutter have cut that? Probably not. Do you want to jump down, guys? Yeah. Now finally free, the cockpit needs to be safely lowered to the ground. But setting it down without damaging it will be far from easy. Mark, stick that under that corner. Yeah, on, on. Oh, God. Whoa! Careful, lads. <laughs> it got a bit hairy, but uh, once we got it under control, it was OK. Listen in now. Put it on the floor, get these bits of 4 by 2 underneath it. Down a little bit more. Gently. We enjoy crane days. There's lots going on. Uh, you can see uh, what you've been working towards uh, coming off the aircraft, and it's enjoyable. Left up to its own you devices. Your hands, huh? Don't worry. My hands are out. All right there, Phil. And with that, the cockpit <laughs> is finally down. Well, thanks for all the boys. Got it off. I'm really happy that it's all off. The, all the doors can go up now, and they're ready. The, the, cap, the chippies are waiting to box them all up. So it's all, all ready and nice. The Boeing 737 has now had all of its valuable components stripped out and sold on. And all that's left is a sorry-looking scrap job. So I've got about 20 foot to go on it and they'll be finished. It seems this scrapping has drawn a crowd of onlookers. It looks like a dragon eating their breakfast. I never seen before like if the aircraft is crashing like that. Like a dinosaur, isn't it? You see. Yeah. And these are boys who are used to doing the more careful disassembling part of the job, not the wrecking. Hundred tons of scrap metal all munched on by the deathly jaws of the digger. But is the machine getting a bit too greedy? Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's what you got to be careful about here. Yeah. It might be sad to watch such a beautifully engineered piece of kit getting mashed up, but Sam seems pragmatic about it. This has done its job. They've made the money out of it. Nice. Dogs are getting old and uh, past its best, so uh, it's like your car. Once your car gets to the end of its life, that goes to the scrapyard, does the same thing done to it. Can't keep cars on the road forever, can't keep their cut in the air forever. And when you look up there, you see it, you see it all crumbling. There's not much of it, is there? The skin, not much to it. The bit there, you missed MB, you see it. Yeah. Yeah, you have to go and get that in a minute. You look at it all the time, but <laughs> you can find it. It's not. Well, you have to go and get it now, mate. <laughs> hey. <laughs> now it's scrap. Life is done. Circle of life. Circle of life. That's a good one, that, isn't it? I couldn't have put it better myself. And there's not a morsel left. It's another job well done for the lads from E-Cube. <laughs>